According to the Nigerian National Population Commission, about 9.6% of people are living with disability in Nigeria, thereby making disability inclusion an instrument in eradicating certain barriers to social inclusion, equity, and participation of PWDs towards promoting their rights and well-being. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, is said to have made provisions for PWDs such as braille ballots for voters with visual impairment, magnifying glasses for people with albinism and enlarged posters for voters with hearing impairments. However, the inclusion does not stop, doesn't stop there as the Disability Society has asked for recognition in President Bola Tinumbu's government. The group stated that the inclusion of persons with disability in the federal cabinet will bring about a more comprehensive and effective governance, fostering a society that truly upholds the principle of equality, diversity, and social justice. Joining me to discuss this are Shedrak Danladi, project officer, Disability Inclusion in Governance, Kaduna. Rose Daniel, Project Officer, Disability Inclusion in Governance, Abuja. And Ophelia Patrick, Media and Communication Officer, Disability Inclusion in Governance. Yeah, we can hear you. Fantastic. And that voice is the voice of Danla, do you want to believe? Yeah, this is Chetra Danladi on the call. Danladi, would you want to kindly help our viewers come into the world of an average uh, disability challenged a person? What are the challenges you face on a day-by-day -day basis in a society like ours? Okay. Um, once again, we'd like to appreciate the Anchor and Plus TV for the opportunity given to us um, to discuss on the inclusion of persons with disabilities in governance, with special emphasis on women with disabilities. I think if I get your background correctly, you were you actually quoted the statistic from National Population. Council Commission uh, about 27 million Nigerians are persons with disabilities. And if you should check our entire population as a country, the population of persons with disabilities is a very large chunk in our population as a nation. But sadly, Persons with disabilities have been willfully neglected and marginalized in our society. Despite existing legislations like the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the Nigerian Disability Rights 2018, and even the special provision met by INEC in the Electoral Act 2022, which met special provisions for the participation of persons with disabilities in electoral process. Now, this will tell you that the level of marginalization of persons with disabilities, particularly women, can never be overemphasized. That's why Cedar Seed Foundation, in partnership with uh, Plaque and MacArthur Foundation, identified this very important gap. Now embark on an advocacy to call on policymakers, government, and key stakeholders to include persons with disabilities in governance. Okay, because thank you. Like let, let me... any other person, persons with disabilities have all it takes 
to make contributions to nation building and the growth of this very nation. Okay, so let, let, let me get to one of your colleagues. Let me get to o Ophelia. Uh, you particularly must be a woman because we're not. Hello? Hello? Okay, that lady, you may want to continue because as it is now, we seem to have lost your colleague or colleagues. Hello, Dan Ladi. Hello. Okay, Rose. Hello. Uh, okay, good to know. Rose. I'm with you. Okay, when Dan Ladi uh, did his uh, uh, introduc introductions, he also specifically mentioned the fact that uh, this should be focusing more on women. Fortunately, you are a woman. What angle would you want to take to contribute to this? Come again, please. I didn't hear you. Can you speak louder? Rose, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, Rose, how would you want to start your contribution to today's program. Okay, I would like to highlight on the issue of um, underrepresentation and the challenges that women with disabilities are facing in the electoral and political participation and even the inclusion in government policy. I can hear myself. The echo is interrupting me. Nobody is interrupting you from the studio. And the MCR, the please, we need to be a bit quiet. The echo. Okay. Okay, so I would like to advocate for proper implementation of the policies that has to do with inclusion of women with disabilities in the decision making table and also in governance. Basically, go about about that. Would you have some suggestions? Would you want to speak to some specific institutions and uh, architecture of state? How would you want to suggest being uh, being involved? Yes, I would like to speak to the government, give some recommendations and also the general public. Go ahead to make those specific recommendations and suggestions. All right. I would like the government to fast track the implementation of Clause 54 of the Electoral Act, which gives room for persons with disabilities to vote and be voted for into any electoral office in the country. And I would also like the electoral system to be accessible for persons with disabilities. I would also like the government to be intentional in fast-tracking the implementation of the UNDP Act Section 29 of Leaving No One Behind and also the implementation of Disability Act 2018. We have all these policies in place, but they are not implemented at all 
in this country. Therefore, women with disabilities and persons with disabilities entirely have been relegated to the background. So that's the most important issues that we want to raise in this discussion. Okay, let me let me go to your colleague now, Dan Ladi. Is Dan Ladi still there? Yes, I'm here. I'm on the call. Okay, Dan Ladi, uh, uh, from what you and your colleague have stated, it is becoming clearer to me that this may be pieces of baggage that is generally inflicted on the society as a result of poverty, cultural, material, and intellectual poverty. And we may need to attend to some fundamental problems before we get to uh, the rightful demands that you people are making. How would you respond to that? Well, I don't actually get your question clearly, but if I get you correct, you are trying to tell us that, uh, to ask me that cultural background, poverty, and other factors are the major things that are causing the marginalization of persons with disabilities in the society. Is that correct? You, you are very, very right. And, and I'm also... Uh, let me also add to that by saying that when opportunities are limited, and especially when uh, the focus on cre expanding the wealth of society is not tackled, even when some of you are put in government, it becomes very tokenistic, as they do now to the youths. They put a couple of youths in, in some cabinets, but the large majority, preponderant majority of the Nigerian youths are left in organic and functional poverty. And they are out there just milling around without something productive to do. But the tokenism would have been fulfilled. I wouldn't want to respond to that. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, uh, government needs to be intentional and have the political will to get some things done in the society. I think we are not asking for much. We are only asking for the implementation of the 5%. It is a constitutional right. We have legislation that have set aside 5% of the inclusion of persons with disabilities in, in governance, in employment, and, and working areas. So when you try to bring the poverty factor and other cultural identities that affect the Nigerian society, we cannot, oh, I cannot shy away from that basic truth. There are factors that are affecting our growth as a country. But however, there should never be a yardstick to stop the inclusion of persons with disabilities in governance. We have had world leaders who were persons with disabilities and they made significant contributions to the growth of their nation and the world at large. Now, if you should check statistics, President Bola Ahmed Pinibu has met appointment and other states' governments have met appointment. how many percent or how many individuals are persons with disabilities? In areas where there were such appointments, how many women been appointed that are women with disabilities? A woman in nature, either she has disability or she did not have disability, is vulnerable in nature as far as the Nigerian society is concerned. And then consider how vulnerable a woman with disabilities is. So it is only when persons with disabilities are ably represented in government, that's when 
they can push for policies that actually addresses their needs and concerns. Like the popular saying goes, nothing without us, nothing for me without us. So we they, we have to be in the in the in the in the negotiation table where decision is being made, where allocation of resources are being made, in order for us to have a larger representation for ourselves. So therefore, the poverty, the cultural divide, are not reasonable enough to stop the inclusion of women with disabilities or persons with disabilities in governance. Dan Ladi, I, I, really, I really agree with you that in a normal environment where people want to be progressive and where people want to be innovative in improving the quality of lives of, uh, of people, are uh, ordinary, especially those in leadership. Every, and I'm, I'm not talking about political leadership alone. I'm talking of even people like ourselves talking here because we are in leadership. But having said that, you will see that even in the cabinet, either at the national level or at the state level, uh, the percentage of women is still very low, like women generally. And apart from that, even the percentage of the youth is still very low. So I am thinking aloud with you now. I fully agree with your position. But you know what? We must go to the table to these seemingly intellectually lazy people in leadership with some concrete ideas that we can work them through. So I really want to trade ideas with you now and, and Rose. What will be some specific, specific ideas that we can trade with them to handhold them to what they should be doing right? Like all these things the ideals that you have spelled out, the two of you. Yes, we are not going to get tired of uh, holding government accountable and uh, being on their neck to ensure that they do the needful. That's the number one step that will be done. All we are saying that the, the, the Nigerian society have let down laws and legislation that actually address these issues we have mentioned. But the implementation of this loop is what we lack. So therefore, we will keep on calling on government to do the needful, and we will keep on encouraging the society. Like you said, it is not just in politics. We need participation in all aspects of life. So members of the societies and Nigeria must first and foremost recognize that persons with disabilities have the right to privileges and opportunities like any other Nigerian. Uh, Daladi, thank you. Uh, le let me give an uh, opportunity now to, to your colleague. Rose, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. I know that as a result of our cultural baggage, you may just, as a woman... I yield the ground totally to the two men talking beside you. Rose, this is much about you too. How would you want to contribute to some of the things that uh, Dan Ladi has stated thus far? Yes, I agree with what Dan Ladi has said. You know, the issue is that women with disabilities face triple jeopardy. First, as a woman, second, as a woman with disability, and then, thirdly, the society is not friendly to us. When a woman with a disability comes out to contest for an elective position, you will see people discriminating, you will see a lot of attitude. You know, attitudinal challenge is one of the issues that is weighing us down. But I would like to state it categorically that the general public should know that disability is not inability. 
And also the government should give us a chance to bring out our potential. We have a lot of people that are capable among us. Rose. We have CEOs of NGOs. R Rose. Yes, I'm with you. I, I fully agree with you, but I am thinking, do we really have to limit this to the government alone? Why must a TV station not give you the opportunity that this TV station is giving you now. Why should other, other spheres of society not awesomely engage with the talents and the giftings of people with disability? So I am not against you, uh, I am not against you lasering in on the government but I'm thinking the government is just a reflection of who we are organically and as a whole. What do you think about that? Yes, it all boils down on the government because we are citizens and we are being excluded. That is why we are raising our voices to address these concerns. If the government will give us a chance to be on the decision table, if the government should appoint a minister as a woman with disability, if they appoint us as SSA and other key positions, the whole system, the people, the general public and everybody will give us that right. They will include us and they will see value in us. Oh, yes. And oh. that is why we are first tackling the, the government to include us. And when they include us, all other things will fall in place. Oh, okay. Um, Rose, I can't agree uh, any, any less than, you know, your submission. Uh, with you on, on that submission... I can't agree any less too uh, with Dan Ladi, and I really want to use this opportunity to enjoin the view, view public um, the degree to which we extend opportunities to people with disabilities, the degree to which we accommodate them and make them feel uh, that they are dignified, they are members of the dignified body of humanity speaks to the degree to which we are progressive and indeed we can best appropriate all the energies and the creative uh, energies of our society. I want to thank you, Dan Ladi. Is Dan Ladi there? Yes, I'm here. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. And Rose, My pleasure. Uh, Rose, I really also have to thank you for having beauty. I, I guess I'm smelling something, you know, the fragrance of rose now too. I really want to thank you for the opportunity of engaging with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank Our you. pleasure. Thank you. Today's throwback of Ba'aki Shemoyi the 18th century Oba of Lagos, whose pre-ascendancy misfortune helped to make Lagos to be the most cosmopolitan commercial capital of West Africa. Oba Kishemoyi reigned as Oba of Lagos from around 1704 to 1749. His father was Oba Ado, a corrupted colloquial pronunciation of Edo, please note that anytime you hear the word Ado in, in someone's or somewhere's name in Lagos, indeed, across the land of Olukumi, meaning my friend or compatriot, which Yorubas called themselves before Uclopitin, whilst interviewing Sultan Belo of Sakoto around 1824, recorded in his note that the Sultan referred to as Yoruba, the corny people, hence the people of Yoruba ancestry in Latin America, 
whose phobias were shipped into slavery long before the rechristening still called themselves the Lukumi people. It, Ado, speaks to connections with Benin and or Moyin, the Lages, whose pervasive historical role in the formation of Lagos, as we now know it, has been largely misclassified for Benins. And his siblings were Erelukuti and Obagabaro, uh, whom he succeeded. Under his brother's Obagabaro's reign, Akishamoyi had a disagreement with his brother over the installation of all of his descendants as chiefs, which led to Akishamoyi's banishment to Akpa, Yoruba's historical coastal or littoral precinct of which today's Badagri is an area. It was while he was in exile that he was exposed to commerce and built relationships with European slave traders. This misfortune, as you will see later, ultimately culminated in the signature cosmopolitanism and the commercial vibrancy of Lagos. When Gabaro died, Akishemoyi became Oba around 1704. He formally established trade trading in Lagos by inviting Portuguese and Brazilian slave merchants whom he was doing business with in exile at Akpa. Historian, the revived historian J.F. Adia Jai asserted that Akishemoyi granted a monopoly on slave trade to his Brazilian and Portuguese trading partners. Lagos, in time, overtook the ports of Hadai or Wadai and Port Novo, which are now located in Benin Republic, but were the two main Olukumi's seaports that functioned as the leading slave ports in the Bight of Benin. Under Akishamoyin's reign, Igai Dugoron was for the first time covered with porcelain tiles, reportedly presented as gifts by Portuguese slave merchants. Akishemoni died in 1749 and was reportedly buried in Benin. In conclusion, do you know that the miserable circumstance of life that you are presently wading through may eventually define your legacy in gold? Just as that pre ship exile experience made of Akishemoyin's reign, an unforgettable era in Lagos, which is aptly captured in one of his in one of the lines of his pen, that is Oriki in Yoruba, Omo Alowo Loko Koyimbotode, Oyimbode Ton, Owono Nkosi, he who has made maritime wealth before the arrival of the Caucasians. And at the arrival of the Koke, and at the arrival on the shores of Lagos, his wealth multiplied. And that's it on the show tonight. I am Bola Oba. Have a good night.